pray together. Father, we thank you for the immovable hope that we have in you, and that in that hope we know with full certainty that we will praise you forever, that we will rejoice in who you are for eternity, that we will be freed from sin and every obstacle to being able to glorify you well. We long for that day. We thank you for the certain hope that we have of that day when we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we've been making our way uh, the previous weeks before Easter through a series that I have titled, The Divine Provisions of a Good God. And if you're new or visiting, my family endured, uh, have been walking through a very significant trial since October 12th of 2020. On that Monday afternoon, we were vacationing at a family property, and as we were preparing to come home, we were loading up my truck and Um, I explained in more detail in the other sermons uh, what took place, but where I had thought my children had dispersed behind me, our youngest child, Caleb, who is five years old, had made his way in front of my truck, and as I pulled the truck forward to move it closer to the house, I inadvertently ran over my son, and he died in that moment. Our, Our lives were changed dramatically in that moment. We had a world of sorrow that we never would have imagined. And yet with that, we had a world of comfort and peace and joy that is inexplicable, except for in the Lord. If you know the Lord, it's, it's not surprising that he would grant to his children peace in the midst of turmoil, joy in the midst of heartache, contentment in the midst of tragedy. He's a faithful God. He is a good God. He is a benevolent God. He is a loving God. And that didn't change on that day. It was actually expressed all the more personally and intimately. And as we felt more deeply hurt and sorrow. And so we've been looking at together, we've been having the opportunity for for me really, and as a reflection of our family to share the ways that the Lord has cared for us in this season. The ways that his goodness has shined forth, the way that he has provided for us. And I could spend hours and hours and hours recounting all the many ways that the Lord has cared for us. In this series, however, I've really honed in on divine provisions, provisions that are unique to the believer, and there have been many ways that we have been cared for and served, and so as I've said each week, I don't want to minimize or take away of the selfless love and the generous care that we've received from so many extended family and friends and neighbors have just poured out love and support. People we don't even know have poured out support and care for us, and those things are, are truly meaningful truly meaningful, but what I've been highlighting are the divine provisions of the Lord, things that are, that are particularly available for the Christian. And so the first week, we looked at the Word of God and how God's Word has been a means of His grace in our life and sustaining us and upholding us in the midst of our sorrow and pain and hurt. And then last time, we looked at the body of Christ, the local church, the local assembly of believers in Christ, all of you and It was such a sweet gift to have an opportunity to boast in God's grace towards us through all of you. Well, this morning, we're going to wrap up this series looking at the hope of eternity. The hope of eternity, and this is absolutely something that is unique for the believer. Only believers have this hope. And God's word has informed us and instructed us to know the gift of the hope of eternity. And so this morning, I really want to boast in the Lord and what he has provided and what he has done and in what awaits each one of us who are in Christ. The week that Caleb passed away, we were vacationing together and there were many wonderful memories. I've already shared some. I'd like to share a few others. We had an opportunity to 
um, process a deer, so we butcher our own animals. For some of you, that probably is gross. For us, it's fun. <laughs> Caleb was a big cheerleader in that, and so we get the meat grinder out, and we're working with all of it, and everybody's chipping in, and Caleb's standing up on a chair and putting bacon in the mix, because that's how we do it. We do it right. We, uh, <laughs> we add some bacon into our grind. It's delicious. Invite yourself over for dinner, and we will have some together. Just wonderful memories, wonderful smiles, tremendous laughter together, precious memories. The Sunday before Caleb passed away, we took a, a trip. We, we frequently go out on our families side by side. We squeeze in it, and we can go up into the mountains and on different trails. And there's an area close to our property where a guy has a barn, and he opens up his barn as kind of a community hangout, and they serve all sorts of different beverages and pulled pork sandwiches and ice cream for the kids, and uh, you can purchase things there. And they also have uh, a few ponies, and for the kids, they'll give them little bags of carrots, and they can go feed the ponies. And we went and did that together on Sunday. We had no idea what awaited us the next day, but just a precious, precious memory together, where Caleb giggling as the nose of the pony tickled his hand and ate the carrots out of his hand. The day that Caleb passed, he and I took a trip to the gas station together to fill up gas cans, and it was a wonderful trip. The Lord was so kind just in the conversation that we were able to have as we were driving there. He and I were talking, and he said, Dad, do you think my kindergarten class at school could come up to the ranch and ride the quads with us, I think they'd really like it. And I said, well, that's a really good thought, buddy, but I don't, I don't know how wise it would be to have a bunch of five-year-olds driving quads around together. <laughs> there was a newer kid in the class that actually lives in our neighborhood that he was aware of, and he said, well, can he just come? I said, well, we'll have to talk to your mom about that. It's like the ultimate dad deferral. so sweet. He wanted to share good things with his friends, and that was a predominant attribute of Caleb. On the drive back, we had wonderful conversation. We were practicing letters together, and so letter sounds. So he's going A. A is for A. Ah, A. Ah, apple. And then we go, okay, B. B is for B. B. Baby. And then we got to C, and we go, C is for K. K. And he goes, cat. And I go, yeah, buddy, but there's something else that starts with C. And he goes, K. C car. And I go, yeah, good job. That starts with C. Caleb, there's something else that starts with C. <laughs> and I love this thing so much. And he goes, C -c cows. <laughs> <laughs> Even my son knows my affinity for beef. <laughs> I said, well, I like cows a lot, but this thing that starts with C is in the truck right now. And I'm talking to him and I love him and I love being his daddy. And he goes, C is for me. <laughs> Just hours later, he'd pass. What a gift from the Lord. We uh, took a little trip. There's a pond on the property. We took a little trip down to the pond to set out some cameras so that we could try to see what animals were coming into the pond. And Julie was working just really intentionally to clean up the ranch, and um, she paused her efforts and came with us, and we all piled into the side-by-side -side and drove down the little trail down to the pond, and it was our last trip together as a family. Again, we had no idea. But these memories are such kindnesses of the Lord, these sweet, sweet joys that we were able to have together just moments before Caleb's passing, we had no idea that these would be our last moments as a family of six. And they are so precious to us. We look back at these sweet provisions, and there is comfort for us, and there is encouragement. And we thank God for such precious moments. But while these memories we look back to provide us sweet comfort, there is something that we look forward to that is far more precious to us. Far more impactful, far more meaningful. And that's the hope of eternity. That's what we have in Christ. And this hope of eternity, this hope is not an uncertain well-wishing. 
I hope this does or doesn't happen. No, this hope is certain. This hope is fixed. It's concrete. This hope is a looking forward to something with a a confidence in respect to the fulfillment, a certainty that it will come to pass. It is a complete assurance regarding the future and the fulfillment of God's promises. This certain hope gives a a great courage to remain unaffected by afflictions and struggles and hardships at a heart level because of what we know awaits us. And so when Scripture says in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And when we know Philippians 3, 20 and 21, that says that our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. And when we consider 2 Corinthians 5, 521, that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And when we consider 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, that says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be received in the last last time, and countless other passages that attest to the same realities with precious, wonderful truths for the believer. We have a bold confidence in light of this. We have a hope of what awaits us, because of the gospel. And I want to mention, again, my outline is on the website. All of the passages that I'm referencing are there. You can go back and find those if you'd like. We have a hope in an eternity reconciled to God, and it is certain for the believer. There is a life beyond this one where there is no more sorrow No more hardship, no more suffering, no more pain. Every tear will be wiped away, and this is a sure hope. What a gift from the Lord. What does this hope bring? It brings brings much, but this morning I'd like to highlight three benefits of the divine provision of the hope of eternity and how God has used this hope of eternity in my life, in Julie's life, in our family's life. And so this morning, the first benefit of this divine provision of the hope of eternity that I'd like to highlight is this, this hope of eternity, it grants an eternal perspective. It grants an eternal perspective. When you understand the hope of eternity, it grants to you, it gives to you an eternal perspective, a perspective beyond this life. Turn to Romans 8. Romans 8. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. Turn to Romans 8. I want you to see this with me in just a moment. Mount Humphreys here in Arizona has a peak elevation of uh, 12,637 feet. And as you drive up to Flagstaff, this looks large until you stand near Denali, the highest peak in North America, which has a summit elevation of 20,310 feet. This seems large until you consider Mount Everest, which has an elevation of 29,032 feet. That seems high. That seems like a long distance until you hear that the moon orbits the earth approximately 238,900 miles away from the earth. That seems impressive. That seems like an astronomical distance until you consider the radius of the Milky Way galaxy, which is believed to be 52,850 light years across. At this point, we've moved well into things that are incomparable. 
To compare the summit of Mount Humphreys to the radius of the Milky Way galaxy is really not even a reasonable comparison. Well, there are things that are so disproportionate, they aren't worth comparing. I want you to see what Paul says two of these incomparable things are. Look at verse 18 of Romans 8. Paul says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What awaits the believer in eternity puts appropriate perspective to the moment. It grants us an eternal perspective. However, the size of the Milky Way galaxy doesn't make Mount Humphreys smaller. It's still tough to climb, but it brings perspective. The hope of eternity, the, the glory that is to be revealed to us is so grand when we see our Savior and we are made like Him, when we are enveloped by God's glory and transformed and radiate His glory for eternity, whatever you are experiencing now is not worthy to be compared to what you will experience that day and for all eternity. The sufferings of this present time are in a different category, not even worthy of comparison. And yet that doesn't make our trials not a trial. It doesn't make our pain not hurtful. But it brings appropriate perspective that is unique for the believer and precious for the soul. The reality has brought to us such a comfort and such a hope. The intensity of our pain is real and present. And this reality doesn't minimize that in any way. It accentuates what we have to look forward to in eternity. That is a gift from the Lord that brings perspective, eternal perspective to momentary issues and trials and sufferings and hardships that where you are right now is not where you will always be. And so there is hope, a certain hope. The reality is in the face of tragedy and trials, there are many temptations to place your hope and to seek out comfort, to desperately look for something to find peace in, or sometimes something just to escape the pain. And people get into all sorts of trouble looking to things outside of God for satisfaction of that hurt. Various sins, escapes, temporal, mundane things, trying to control your circumstances, trying to control people, People need to do this for me, then I'll be happy. People need to care for me this way, then I'll be served well, then I'll be content. I need something to get my mind off the issue, and you look and you try to fill it with anything, grasping for anything to help with the hurt, because the hurt is real. But everything is like air slipping through the fingers except for Christ, except for the promises of God. He is faithful. He tends to the brokenhearted. He heals the wounded. One of those great means of his care for his people is what awaits us in eternity and the perspective that that brings to every moment of hardship. It brings it into perspective. Whatever is going on in your life right now that has been weighing you down, that has been burning your soul, it is momentary, and it isn't even worthy to be compared with what awaits you, believer. Oh, press on. Don't lose heart. Endure. Be faithful. I want to pull back the drapes a little bit on where that fight has taken place or took place for us early on. We had to work through what we believe about where Caleb went when he died. 
did he go to heaven? Matthew 13, verses 18 through 23, Jesus gives an explanation of the parable on the seed and the sower. He says in verse 18, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown, this is verse 20, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only but it is only temporary, and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Verse 23, and the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. There's a protection oftentimes for a child growing up in a Christian home from afflictions or persecutions, from worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth. And this is a gift from God for children to grow up in a home like that, to have the gospel presented to them early and to be protected from the worries of the world. But with that comes an uncertainty as to what soil the gospel has fallen on. And Julie and I have been careful to not, in our earnest, passionate desire for our children to be saved, to prematurely declare them as such. Rather, we teach them the truth, we train them in the Lord, we affirm every desire for the things of the Lord, we teach that the fruit of repentance over time will demonstrate itself, but that there is a benefit to giving that time before we make conclusive declarations. Caleb was five years, nine months, and 20 days old when he passed. Julie and I, in our hearts, did not want to rush Caleb into heaven selfishly as the primary means of finding peace or hope in our sorrow. So we instructed ourselves that the righteousness of God is more precious to us even than where Caleb is. Not that it doesn't matter or doesn't have a place to ponder or consider, but God's righteousness, that he would do what is right, is more important to us than where our child is right now. We would not let go of that conviction. God's character is far more precious to us than our son's eternity. It has to be. He's our Lord. The moment it's not, it's idolatry. And so we refuse to run to that as a means of hope. We wanted our hope to be in God. We did not trust our hearts to think with clarity beyond what we knew, which is that God is good, and wherever Caleb was, it was the right place, is the right place. So we sat with our kids and said, listen, here, here's what we know, and this is where our hope must be. Now listen, I'm, I'm not saying it would have automatically been sin to have concluded that Caleb was in heaven, not, not at all, but Julie and I, we were wary of our own hearts. And our propensity to look for hope in anything other than God, more than God. We wanted God to be where our hope was found. We wanted to emulate the psalmist when his soul was distressed. Where did he direct himself? Just listen for a moment to Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? What does he tell himself? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Just a few verses later in verse 11, why, again, the same refrain, why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. Not hope in who you think God should be. Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the health of my countenance and my God. 
Now, as several weeks passed, Julie and I considered God's word and what does God say the fruit of repentance is? Well, love for God, love for people. Caleb could articulate the gospel. He knew what sin was. He knew he was a sinner. He knew the only way to be forgiven sins was through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. He communicated a love for Jesus and a desire to live for Jesus. Caleb loved the Bible. He was the first most evenings to request or ask if we were going to do family Bible studies together, which was just sweet. He'd want his Bible open to the right page, even though he couldn't read. Kyla recounted with us how when they would play house, he wanted to be the one who led family Bible studies, and when they played school, he wanted to teach the Bible lessons. He loved He loved the corporate gathering. He was soft-hearted towards correction. He had a tender conscience. He loved people. He was generous to others. A defining characteristic, as I already mentioned, was that Caleb loved to share good things with others. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't sinless. But there were evidences expressed in this five-year-old boy that indicate a love and a yield yielded heart before the Lord. And so we believe the Lord saved that little boy young. We're grateful for that. We didn't rush him there to find peace for our own hearts. We don't want to violate what scripture says out of selfish reasons. We want our hope in God. But as time went on and we had an opportunity to examine the circumstance in light of God's word and even seek counsel and input from the elders We testified to what we knew, and and we think Caleb's in heaven. And there's a sweetness to that. Even this week, I was walking with Jake this week, and he asked how Easter was for us, and thinking about the resurrection, and the resurrection for those who are in Christ, and what that would be like with Caleb one day. And it was so precious, and a benefit, but not our primary hope. If we're wrong about this, God will still be faithful and good and righteous and just. We won't complain when we get there. But just from a personal standpoint, we think he's there and we're grateful for that. And we rejoice and we thank God for saving Caleb early. In fact, we've talked often, Julie and I, that we think when we get to heaven, Caleb will be eager to want to take us and enjoy Christ together. Because that's what he liked to do here on earth. He loved to enjoy good things together, and that's a wonderful memory. That's a wonderful thought. We're thankful for that. Now listen, we had no idea October 12th was going to be our last day with Caleb. Dads, lead your home. Shepherd your children. Teach them the gospel. Don't let the pattern of your life be a, I'm too tired, I'm too busy to teach your children truth. You don't know how many days the Lord has given them to you. Remove every obstacle and make every provision for the Lord to save your children. God was so kind to us. Julie and I discussed how kind it was of the Lord that as we pondered the time that we had with Caleb, we honestly have no regrets We weren't sinless as parents, but there was no undealt with conflict. Even as we reflected about the ways that we poured into him and taught him truth and disciplined him, we don't have any regrets by God's grace. That is a gift from the Lord. And I never would have imagined that October 12th would have been Caleb's last day in this life, and I'm so grateful that we did not squander the time that we had with him. Now listen, do not let this be an occasion to live in fear. That's not the point. That would be a clear violation of Scripture. I've got to do everything because I'm afraid about tomorrow. Can't do that. Do not live in fear of the uncertainty of tomorrow, but rather live intentionally in the gift of today. Be faithful today. 
There's such a benefit for the believer when you maintain an eternal perspective, when you realize that you're not living for this life alone. You are living for something far beyond this life. You are living for eternity. And that is a gift from the Lord that he has granted to you if you are in Christ. There have been many late nights, early mornings, moments of deep pain, and yet knowing that the suffering of this time and the hurt that we experience now, whatever is hard, whatever is weighty, whatever you might be going through, which feels even at times overwhelming, how can I move forward? How can I go on? This hurts. This is hard. This is relentless. You can come back and you can say, what does Scripture say? What has God revealed? What is true in my circumstance? And that is that whatever I'm going through right now is not worthy to be compared to what lies ahead. This is a gift from the Lord, and it brings appropriate perspective, a right perspective to every circumstance in life as you consider each moment in the weight of eternity. I inadvertently ran over my son and killed him. I was God's providential means of bringing an end to Caleb's time in this life. Every day I feel the weight of that. (laughs) And every moment of sorrow in missing Caleb is closely tied to the sorrow that I did it. (laughs) Just to be honest, it is hard beyond anything I've experienced, and in all honesty... I've thanked the Lord because if someone had to bear this, I am glad it's me and not someone else. But it's brutal. (laughs) But the perspective of eternity brings a comfort and a hope, knowing that as intense of pain, this is the there is a sweetness in what awaits us in heaven. And it's beyond comparison. That doesn't make it easier today, but it brings appropriate perspective that is intense as the sorrow is. It's not even close, not in the same category of what God has made available to you in his son, Jesus, which you will enjoy for eternity. Thank you, Lord. The magnificence of heaven is is that glorious, and every trial, every pain testifies to the glorious nature of heaven. Consider that for a moment. Every hardship testifies for the believer to the glorious nature of heaven. And yet, so often we just want to get away from pain and get away from hurt. Not that we pursue it in some sort of foolish, silly way, but when it comes into our life, thank God for what it testifies to, which is what he has made possible in the gospel for you, which is eternity with him, a gift beyond measure. The first benefit of the hope of eternity is that it grants an eternal perspective. Next, number two, it motivates righteous living. The hope of eternity, a right view of eternity and an understanding of what awaits us who are in Christ motivates righteous living. We did not get a goodbye with Caleb. We got many precious memories. We didn't get a goodbye. My goodbye came after he was gone as I pulled the blanket back off of his lifeless head and I I kissed his brow. He was gone, and in that moment, I had never hated sin and its effects on this earth and the effects of the fall more than at that moment, and I never longed for heaven more up to that point in my life, and as time passed through our trial, our hope of eternity of heaven intensified all the more every day. We cannot, be, cannot wait to be with our Savior. We cannot wait for that day. Knowing what awaits us in eternity, it it has produced for us a distaste for this world. How could I love sin when the effects of sin in this world brought about death? 
and death took my son. It's not the final say, though, which is why there's hope. The Lord is faithful, and He is good, and He is trustworthy. And so knowing what awaits the believer in eternity produces a distaste for this world and its passing pleasures and an increased exponentially so our desire for godliness. For heaven where there is no more sin, when we are glorified with Christ, able to worship and serve him perfectly, turn to Philippians 3. Paul could not wait for the day when he would be resurrected with Christ, when he would be glorified. Paul could not wait until he was done with sin. And this reality that he so eagerly awaited and longed for created a separation from himself with this world. Look at verse 7. It says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, verse 8, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, And then verse 11, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul could not be close to this world. He could not look to the things of this world. He counted them but rubbish. Anything that he could look to, he counted but rubbish so that he may gain Christ. And in gaining Christ and a righteousness that was not his own, he pursued holiness because he knew what awaits him in a resurrected, glorified body. And he wanted to live in this life as close as he could to that life. And that should be the drive of every believer, not a... a, Abuse of grace that makes you tolerant of sin, but a distaste for this world and its effects out of gratitude for the grace of God in your life that drives you and catapults you towards holiness. If you love sin, if you refuse to repent of sin, if you return over and over to the same sins and think you will enjoy heaven, you are deceiving yourself. Why would you think that? Because what is so glorious about heaven is God himself and the ability to worship him undefiled and unstained by sin, glorified, unhindered, worship of God, enjoyment of him and his splendor and his glory and his majesty for all eternity. We know from Romans 5 and from James 1 that the hardship and the trials and the sufferings of life actually make us more like Christ. It gets us closer to that day from a practical living standpoint. And so we don't reject these things. We consider them joy when we are conformed into the likeness of Christ, regardless of the means to get there. Trials are considered joy because it matures us. It perfects us in the Lord, brings us to God's intended purpose, makes us more holy. We don't reject them. We long for the day when we are sinless, no longer sinning against our precious Lord. And we aspire and we pursue and we seek what is right before God. And in this, we know that God has a purpose in our trial to make us more like Jesus. Julie and I said the first night, as we were crying pretty much constantly, Our refrain was, Lord, this cost was so high. This trial is so intense. Lord, help us to squeeze every ounce of sanctification, everything that you would want to do in us and through us in this trial. Lord, let it it be so. We yield. We submit. (sighs) 
We also pleaded, Lord, you intend our good in this. Guard us from sinning against you. If we truly believe that God providentially brought this to pass, ordained this road for us, Lord, we trust you. We know you have good purposes in this. And so, Lord, by your strength, help us to yield to you. The Lord loves to answer this prayer. Job chapter 1, verse 22, after servant after servant has visited Job, and bad news after bad news is brought. The account says in verse 22, through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. And that blaming is to ascribe unseemliness to God. I have marveled, marveled at the grace of God in my wife. I'm just going to take a moment to boast in God's work in her. In, in, in Caleb's passing, in all that has come with this, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm not just saying this to gain, like, husband points. <laughs> I have not seen my wife sin against the Lord in this circumstance. She has sinned before, just in case you're wondering. It has happened. But in this, I have not seen her sin. I have not seen her blame the Lord. She hasn't blamed me. Days after he died, Caleb, she said, I miss him more than words can express, but I'm content. I trust God. The Lord has supernaturally sustained her. And as I've already said, you all have been a huge means of God's grace in bringing that about. But a right view of eternity does this for the believer. It gives you perspective in the moment that drives you to want to distance yourself from sin when you experience the hardships and the trials of this life. And if it doesn't happen naturally, you force yourself to get there. You speak truth to yourself. I will not associate and run to the very thing that I should hate to the very thing that is an expression of the grotesque nature of sin and its effects. No, I'm going to flee and I'm going to pursue what is right and good and holy and pleasing to the Lord. There are many times in our sorrow where we felt like we were hanging on by a thread, but we knew, we know it's God's thread and it will not fail. He will not fail us. And so with Every temptation to sin, we know there, there is a way of escape and there is a, a reality in this, a tremendous benefit for us, that when we are at the spot where we are at the end of ourselves, we are acutely aware of God's strength and His faithfulness. We have seen God's faithfulness that's expressed from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, where it says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with my weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong." We would have no hope outside of Christ. If you have seen anything that you have been encouraged by, that you have deemed commendable, that you have had a moment of the Kelsos are strong, oh, someday I hope I can be a Christian like that, you are just so confused on the reality of who we are. (laughs) Whatever you see is Christ. We would be in shambles without Christ. And if you see something strong, that actually is a a testimony to our weakness. It is Christ. He is worthy of all praise and all honor. And the same grace that he has lavished upon us, that has sustained us, is available for you, Christian, no matter what trial the Lord has for you or that you're even in now. Lastly, the hope of eternity guards against losing heart. It guards the believer against losing heart. Guards against losing heart. 
Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There is a profound reality that the Lord is intimately working through every single detail of our lives and every single hardship is doing something for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 16 through verse 18. It says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though... Our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Verse 17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. How easy would it be to drown in our sorrow if we did not know that our suffering has a purpose? There is a time where there is no more hardship, no more tears, no more suffering, but that time is not now, and every single hardship of this life is preparing us for the next. It bears weight into eternity Every single moment of hardship, God is using it for something. Every time I grab six plates instead of five, every time we miss the youthful energy of a five-year-old in our home, every time I get behind the wheel and have to address my own heart on fear, every speed bump that catapults me back to the moment, every family picture without Caleb, every trip to the store without my little buddy, every time I accidentally say that I have four kids instead of three, I don't lose heart. I'm not undone by these things because they are doing something for me. It is producing something for me far more glorious than the intensity of any pain of any moment. Caleb, his death, a five-year-old's death being run over accidentally by his father, nobody saw it. In the middle of the mountains of Arizona was not meaningless. It wasn't a random event, a tragic accident. His death was not in vain. God is using it in a myriad of ways. He has been so kind, so generous to so quickly let us see how he has been using it. And Julie and I have marveled at that and said, if God didn't let us see one fruit of this circumstance, he would be no less wise, no less good, no less just, no less loving, no less righteous. And yet he has been so generous to let us so quickly see the ways that he is using it. That is a kindness of the Lord. The greatest desire of every Christian parent is that their child's life would be used by God to bless others and to glorify God. How could I complain about the duration of Caleb's life in light of the intensity of his influence for God's sake and for God's people's sake? God has used Caleb's short, sweet life to do such amazing things and we're only six months in tomorrow. As our story was spreading, we laughed as a family. Caleb was such a gift and so talented in so many ways. We weren't surprised that Caleb became famous. It just came about in a different way than we thought, and yet God is good and he is faithful. The Lord has dealt bountifully with us. And not only that, but for every hurt and every sorrow and every difficult moment, every broken-hearted moment...
every hurt by Caleb's passing, God is using it for eternal benefit, for my eternal benefit, for my wife's eternal benefit, for you who have hurt with us, your eternal benefit. It is producing something for you, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Again, we see that the way that God uses temporal hardships produces eternally significant things that are completely disproportionate from a human standpoint. That's how good God is. In eternity, we will never for a second question if it was worth it because it is so disproportionately better than anything we would have chosen or could imagine. The glory of the next life is beyond all comparison to the suffering of this life. That just makes me so, so excited for heaven. We have hurt so deeply, and if this deep hurt is momentary and light, and beyond all comparison, I can't wait to experience the rewards of heaven. Knowing God is using this for his glory brings a sweetness, not a bitterness, to the various pieces involved. It brings right perspective, right thinking about God, about our hardship, about our pain. Instead of wanting to crawl under a rock, or instead of crawling under a rock, when we want to do that, we say, no, I refuse to do that. The Lord has purpose in this, and I choose to be faithful. Lord, help me. This truth changes radically how you navigate the hard things. Hard is not bad. In every circumstance, there is a sweetness being near to our Lord and knowing he is sovereign and knowing he is good and knowing he is wise. Caleb's best friend in our neighborhood was over at our house a couple months ago, a little bit after Caleb had passed. He was over, came over, and he was playing with Kyla. Julie and I were in the kitchen in our house, and from the other room, we heard him laugh. The laughter of a five-year-old boy, which was at one time so prevalent, had been absent from our home. And as we heard it, it was a bit jarring at first. Julie burst into tears, just Julie. I was totally composed. (laughs) I know what she had heard and asked her, would you like me to send our sweet neighbor boy home? To which she replied, no. Julie doesn't say much emphatically. She said, no, not at all. I love that little boy laughter. I love that little boy, and I want him in our home as much as possible. My wife, by God's grace, understands the sovereignty of God. She is convinced of his wisdom and goodness, and so the hurt that accompanies God's providence is overshadowed by the certainty of his purposes and the unrelenting joy that is found in him. She has taught me so much. So if you have a boy around Caleb's age and have wondered if it was uncomfortable to, for us to be around him or if it's been even uncomfortable for you to have him around us because you're concerned that it might be hard for us in some way, we thank you so much for the consideration. We actually love it. We miss that youthful, playful energy, and so we invite it. Maybe just give us a call first before you drop off your five-year-old and run. (laughs) John Piper, in his book, Providence, says in page 704, I have the quote for you on the screen there. It says, for those who trust Christ, God's sovereignty and suffering is not an unyielding problem, but an unfailing hope. It means that in the suffering of Christians, neither Satan, nor man, nor nature, nor chance is wielding decisive control. God is sovereign over this suffering, which means it is not meaningless. It is not wrath. It is not ultimately destructive. It is not wanton or needless. It is purposeful. It is measured, wise, and loving. 
Even if the suffering is terrible, then the last hour of death, when there is no life left to which the sufferer can be sanctified by it, even then it is eternally purposeful. Whatever you are going through, Whatever hardship, whatever pain, whatever hurt, whatever sorrow, if you are in Christ, it is producing something for you, it is purposeful, and it bears way into eternity for God's glory and for your good and enjoyment, true enjoyment. Yet you only get this hope if you're in Christ. The difficulty of this life is also disproportionate to the wrath that you deserve and will endure for all eternity if you don't repent. Why would anybody ever not turn to Christ? I would plead with you. Turn to Jesus. And if you don't know what that means, if you've never done that, if you don't know what it means to be a Christian, I'd love nothing more than to talk with you about that. These divine provisions of our good God are not just for when things are catastrophic in your life. Every moment on this earth, they are resources for the believer, divine gifts from a loving God. Don't squander them. What have we learned? Don't squander these things. We didn't need them less before Caleb died and then need them more once he died. We need them desperately all the time. God's word, God's church, this hope that we have of eternity, a recognition of this life in comparison to eternity. Someday this life will be over like a vapor. And Christian, as you are enjoying sinlessness and you are basking in the glory of the eternal God, you will not regret one moment of this life's suffering or sorrow or hardship. You will not regret one moment where you yielded to the Lord in faith, where you refused to dwell in self-pity, where you denied your impulse to look to or turn to something other than God. You will be forever captivated by your Savior. It will be glorious. And what a hope we have in our good God and the eternity with him that awaits us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for making a way where there was no way for your love that you would give of your son, that he would take on himself the punishment, the wrath that we deserved in our sinfulness, and that in so doing, you would reconcile us to yourself and give to us yourself for all eternity. We long for that day. We wait for that day. Sorrow, sin, suffering will cease. We will enjoy you. Lord, fuel our hearts with that truth. Let that catapult us into further sanctification and holiness of life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close in worship?